All right, so our course objective is how to evaluate, understand, and train short game with K-Code. So just like full swing, we have all those capabilities with short game as well. We just need to understand some of the adaptations that uh, we should look at uh, in the difference in the motions. So our process to do this, just like the full swing, you're going to collect your data, you're going to understand your player's motion, identify what their need for improvement is, and then communicate and train the plan with your player, and then we'll go through some hints at the, helpful hints at the end. But just the same process essentially as you would take with your full swing again, but we have some different philosophies on short game and uh, some differences in the data that we'll identify here today. The tools that you have to evaluate short game are your multi-swing report, your swing summary report, your performance graphs, and now your tiles. Okay, so again, you can start to go through and determine what you're trying to train and then go to the appropriate report or graph. So how I use it, swing summary report on the left hand side over there is great if you're going to use that with a student as a communication tool. Okay, so the red green is going to give them a really good understanding of kind of where they are and where you want them to be. Just keep in mind that swing summary is built for full swing. So when you go in to the swing summary, I'll show you here at the end on full screen, but you can kind of see in the corners up there, underneath the green and red bar, there's a little button on the right hand side that says edit. Okay, you can edit each individual box on the swing summary. So you can edit the ranges, you can edit the target number you're looking for, you can edit even the, right down to the description that's populated at the bottom if they're inside the range or outside the range. So if you're going to use the swing summary report for short game, you're going to need to edit it, right, to, to adapt to short game. So that's where you can use that. But once you do it, very powerful tool I found to take home or give the players to take home so that they understand kind of what they're working on long term or where their range should be for the short game. Efficiency summary is going to tell you the transition sequence, peak speed sequence, and peak speeds. Again, kind of a complement to your graphs, right? So you can start to communicate with your player how does the kinematic sequence look? How should it look when we're talking about short game relative to the full swing? Because there are some significant differences in the, tr uh, in the sequences for short game versus long game. We always have our performance graphs, right? So you can start to show the player kind of where they are with their body and their, uh, the kinematic sequence for their efficiency of the motion. And then the multi-swing report is really useful if you're starting to use your launch monitor in collaboration with your K-Coach. So now you can start to compare what their body's doing to what the ball and the club are doing, right? So you can really paint that correlation. Especially if you're trying to do things like dial in wedge distances, things like that, it becomes really, really useful when you've got that multi-swing report and you can just look right across the row and say, hey, you rotated X, you know, your ball carried Y, right? And then you can start to paint those correlations. Again, I went through this, so I'll quickly look at each area here. The swing summary and the multi-swing summary uh, is a simple way to look for the player's numbers for bend, side bend, and rotation at the three points of the swing, address, top, and impact. You can look at a single swing or the averages of multiple swings. So again, if you are in your swing summary, okay, that's going to show you this report for a single swing. If you go into your multi-swing report, you can access the multi-swing summary. It looks exactly the same as this, but it's compiled based on all the swings that were taken, right? So it's an average. So if you do like using this, but you've captured, you know, 15, 20 wedge shots, and you want to show it to them based on the average of all of them, go to the multi-swing summary. Like being able to select driver, six iron, wedge. If you're doing wedge yep. short game, make sure you select wedge with what club you're using. That way, when you go to the multi-swing report, you can actually just select, show me wedges. And it'll filter out the other clubs. Yep. So it'll just show you that wedge data. Uh, you're going to have to edit that, that swing summary every time you switch the data. So there's no like where we can have a baseline that, okay, hey, I can pull up this short game yeah, summary. Right. So long. does it stay saved under a player's profile? Yeah. So what you'd want to do is create maybe a separate player. Right, so you've got John Smith, do John Smith short game. You can edit 
the swing summary under John Smith's short game. So essentially, you, it's not going to save every time, but it would stay saved under that other player. So if you're doing wedge work or you're doing short game work with a player, you can load up their short game name. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a way where you won't have to edit it every time. Efficiency summary, again, start talking to your player about once we get through this and, and understand kind of how transition sequence and peak speed sequence changes from full swing to short game. This is a great tool for them to kind of see where they are and then those speed gains, right? Because again, unlike the full swing with a driver, we're not trying to maximize our speed gains anymore. We're trying to control our speed gains to control the shot distance. So again, the graphs, kinematic sequence, pelvis, upper body angles, some good wrist angles right there. Those are real, real keen. So again, we're going to go through all of these. I've got some case studies at the end that show the difference between all of these graphs for a distance wedge, a pitch shot, and a finesse shot or a flop shot. So we'll be able to look at the differences and talk about them. And then finally, that multi-swing report. Again, if you're trying to compare to launch or carry, this is the report you want to use to start to correlate body to wrist very quickly and then make some changes, right? Because as in, when you go into your multi-swing report, remember, you can filter how many shots you take, right? So you can go do a before, maybe you take 10 swings, you do an after, you can take 10 more swings and you can show them top 10 versus bottom 10 and show how the data changes in one easy to read table. All right, so the factors that we're looking at that we want to control in short game for the most part is how high and how far, right? So we've got our trajectory and we've got our distance. So talking about the correlations, and again, you know, we went through some of this in the first uh, presentation about correlating body to club. Same thing holds true for short game. Steeps and shallows, okay, if we can balance out the steeps and shallows, we're going to do a good job with short game. I personally think it's more important in short game than even in full swing because the motion's shorter, right? So if we get that balance right off the bat with the setup, because there are steeps and shallows based on setup and in motion, if we can balance them out right away, we're going we're gonna to get some success with short game. So body positions, body rotation, and the amount of rotation, especially the torso, will start to help us control how far the ball is going to go. Sequencing and acceleration rates play a huge part in that. Okay, So again, more rotation is going to give us the ability to create more acceleration. They go hand in hand. And then sequencing, right? So what sequence are we using? Ground, bottom up, right? Pelvis, torso, arm, and club. Or are they very close together, right? Because if we have a lot of space, in that transition, it's just going to give us more opportunity to create stretch, which puts more energy into the system, and it's going to make it harder to control the shot distance. Okay? Body angles, bend and side bend, how well do they control those, especially with the torso? I call it torso stability. We don't want to see a lot of wobbling with the torso with the short game. Very difficult to make repeatable contact, and again, on a shorter motion with a tighter dispersion needed, we need to really key in on that. And then wrist angles, especially at address and how you set your wrist angles, will help you control the trajectory, okay? Flexion extension, especially controlling the opening and closing of the club face, is going to really help you control how that ball comes off the face and how high it flies. So just like the full swing, we want to develop a training plan you're going to go ahead and set, set those training objectives. So I personally like to break it apart. Okay, So it could get a little bit overwhelming for players if, you know, we've seen, we've seen it all the time. Somebody comes in, they bring their wedge in, grab my wedge here, you know, and they start making motions and we start looking at things like this. Okay, so over rotated, inside shut, right? So we've got multiple things we need to try and train. I would urge you to break them apart. Um, I personally like to work on the club face first. I feel in short game if I can target the club face first and get some repeatable wrist motions, it's easier to complement the body with that. It, it, 
as opposed to vice versa, right? So if we start to just work on rotations and they're still getting way inside and shut, they're still going to have a lot of struggle. So I personally like to go to wrist first, work on that, get that efficient, and then from there attach the body to the arms. You're going to select the program. We'll go through our short game activities uh, in the software. I'll show you how to access those. We have a number of short game activities and I'll show you how to, you can build your own as well. You can save that program under the student and then obviously customize it, right? For live training, set guide live. Everybody know about set guide live here? Yep, perfect. Okay, set guide live is really, really good for short game, especially if you're trying to make their motion very detailed, get them exactly where you want them, set guide live. So short game activities, let me just toggle over to our software real quick and show you where that is. If we go under our train bucket, okay, thank you. So once we're in train, you'll see the icons at the top. Okay, we toggle over to the green with the flag and then we have our short game activities. Okay, so from putting to chipping, pitch shots, bunker shots even, these are all programmed in. A lot of them are going to target the body rotation, bends and side bends again. So if you're looking to do that with your players, start here, see if one applies to what you're trying to work on, and then you could always edit these to fit your player and then you can save them as a player program or a player activity. So there, there's Jason in the show guide info. So you can change the name, you can change what metrics you want to pull up. <clears throat> yep, so there's edit your, your target numbers and your tolerances. I think everybody understands how to do that or has done that, so we're good there. So <clears throat> some examples some of the <clears throat> observations that we make, so finesse shot, this is the first shot. So this shot was essentially, uh, you know, a 10 yard flop shot, okay? So we're looking at the kinematic sequence at the top, we're looking at upper body, <clears throat> excuse me, upper body angles in the middle, and then wrist angles at the bottom right. So just some things to note that are some differences to the full swing, especially in the kinematic sequence. You're going to see fanning acceleration rates rather than stretching acceleration rates. So to reiterate on what that means, okay, stretching would be if I get up to the top of my swing and I start my pelvis before my torso, I create some stretch through the core, same thing. If I rotate my torso against a stable lead arm, I'm creating some stretch between my torso and my arm through my shoulder. Fanning is just the opposite. It's more of a top-down acceleration, okay? So it's the club moving the fastest, the arm moving the second fastest, and then the pelvis actually moving the slowest. Okay, so we can definitely see here at the top up there, if we look at how those lines are accelerating, my club is on top, my arm, my torso, and my pelvis, okay? So we've got the purest form of fanning in that example right there. We also can see there's some slower peak speeds. Again, a shorter shot, we don't need as much acceleration. Your peak speeds are gonna be significantly slower. And then less deceleration. Again, we have less acceleration. We don't have a need for deceleration, right? So you can see how after the peak of each segment, except for the lead arm, right, because that is something that would decelerate because of the acceleration of the club head. But if you look at my torso and my pelvis lines, they just basically flatline, okay? So again, not a lot of acceleration and definitely not a lot of deceleration. Most of the action is made up by my lead arm and club interaction. Body, upper body angles much less rotation, okay, we don't have to go as far. So I believe the uh, rotation there at the top was only around 50 degrees or less, I believe it was even 40. So again, less rotation, and then take note of my side bend and uh, bend lines, very stable, okay, so I'm not rotating a little bit and then diving down or standing up like you'll see some players do to try and manipulate the club. Very stable with the other 
movements of the upper body. I believe firmly in a stable upper body to deliver the club for short game. So if we look at now the wrists, we have the most extension at impact out of any of our motions. We'll see the same typical pattern for the deviation for the most part, maybe not as exaggerated, but the pattern will be the same. We'll also see a similar pattern for flexion extension, but we'll see much more extension at impact because we're trying to get the ball to go high, okay? Yes? So that was a 10 yard flop shot? Yeah. So what would it, how would those graphs compare if you were just hit the 10 yard medium trajectory? Yeah, so the kinematic sequence would be similar in my opinion. Upper body might even be similar. You'll see a big difference in the wrists. Yeah, yep. So this was a pitch shot of about 30 yards, I'd say. So again, this is where we're going to see that difference, right? So we can see that the, the kinematic sequence is similar, but it's not pure fanning anymore. Now we have what's called a little bit of riding, okay? So riding, the difference between riding and fanning is I didn't accelerate the more distal segments more than the proximal. Now they're going about the same speed for a point in time in the swing. So if you look, after transition, this line looks like a single line all the way to right about here, okay? So all my segments were accelerating at about the same speed, and then they start to fan off accordingly, okay? So going from the flop shot to a pitch shot, we go from fanning to riding. We have higher peak speeds, and we still have some less deceleration, right? So we can see, especially in my pelvis there, I'm not seeing much deceleration and still in this motion. A little bit more in the, in the arm, okay? But again, torso and pelvis kind of flat line out. Maybe a tad more in the upper body, but negligible, okay? What's Sorry. the explanation for the arm slowing down? Still because the club head is accelerating, right? And we're releasing the club still in this regard it's going to decelerate the lead arm, right? So this is going to still have some deceleration effect because of the acceleration of the club head. But we don't see that filtering down into the other segments. Isn't that what, is that what you meant? Yeah. Yep. So it slowed down more than the rest? Uh, no, it, so it, the lead arm decelerated more than the torso and the pelvis. Yeah. yeah. So I was just pointing that out that we're still seeing some deceleration in the arm like we did in the flop shot because there's a release of the club head so it stabilizes that lead arm, but we're not seeing very much deceleration yet in the body. Yep. Yeah. Upper body graph, although a little bit more rotation, I think this speaks to what your question was, Paul, it looks almost identical to the flop shot, okay, in terms of the bends and the side bends. The biggest difference that we see is over here in the wrist graph. We have significantly less extension, right? We actually get all the way to square just prior to impact before it tapers off. So in the flop shot, we had about 19 degrees of extension at impact. This one is right around six or seven, okay? So we have much less. And obviously, the launch of the ball came way down. Now our distance wedge shot. So we can definitely start to see some differences in these motions compared to the previous two. We now have some stretching, okay? So you can see between my pelvis and my torso, I've got some space there where the red line's on top, so I've got a little bit of stretch between my pelvis and my torso and very, very little, mostly riding between the lead arm and the club. This was a wedge shot that went about 90 yards, okay, with a 56 degree wedge. So it was about 85% of max, I would say. We can also see the deceleration patterns. Now we're starting to see what we would typically see in a more full speed shot, right? So as you build up, you'll start to see this graph look more and more like you're used to seeing with full swings. Our, up, our upper body graph, we have more rotation, 80 degrees now on this one, relative to 40 and about 55 on the other two. And we can start to see we still have a stable upper body between the bend and the side bend. 
where bend is translating to side bend accordingly from address to top. And then again, no extension down here at impact, right? So zero, I think it was negative uh, 0.8, right? So essentially zero. So now we're starting to get a lower launch, more compression on the ball, distance, distance wedge shot, full wedge shot. And one thing you'll notice is see how much sharper the lines are moving vertically in that wrist graph? It's much more aggressively yes. knuckling down or hitting that motorcycle. So if we, go, if we go back here, you can see in the flexion extension line, the green line, there's a little bit of a peak and then a drop off, but it's pretty gradual. Jason is speaking to the significant spike just before impact, right? So knuckling down or whatever you want to call it. Speaking to Paul's point on using your launch monitor in conjunction with your K-Coach for short game, one of the things I did with my uh, kids in Thailand a lot was we would do short game combines, track man combines. I'd edit it to be a short game combine. I'd make the test. We would do it with the K-Coach on, with the biofeedback first, and then without, or we toggle it back and forth so that they were getting some reinforcement. And when I talk about biofeedback, I'm talking about body rotation so that they were hitting the same rotations each time so that then they knew that they were getting into the same rotation. So now if they were focusing on the speeds of their body, they had the reassurance that their rotations were the same so they could focus on speed, right? So we're trying to take away one piece that they had to worry about when doing that combine. So I'd start with that and then I would start to filter away the biofeedback and see how the combine score would be affected. The kids that I, were, that I was coaching, they were having two problems controlling their distances. One, changing the positions of their body in the swing. The other was actually having a transition sequence that was more like a power shot instead of a finesse or a distance wedge. Again, the sequence in the transition is the same, but their acceleration rates were stretching, right? So I wanted to isolate the speeds to let them just focus on that. So that's how I used biofeedback. I'd set the rotation numbers for them, and I'd say, okay, we know you're getting the tone. We know you were in the right position. Let's just focus on your speeds. And I saw their proximity come way in. So that was very effective. Yeah, and Joe's point to gaming this stuff, like being able to make games out of it, we talk about it with the juniors all the time, but the adults will respond just as well to those types of games and, and situations. To, they want to, like everybody is playing some sort of game probably when they're out playing. So being able to give a little pressure and helps it stand up when they're practicing, because we talk about this all the time, is golf one of the only sports you'll ever play where practice is easier than the play? There's no consequences to most of our practice. We just rake another ball and hit it. So how do you build that pressure? Sometimes we, can, we have to start doing it on the range by either shrinking the, the range. So we might say cut off half a green and any ball outside of that. Um, but any of these kind of games, when you're working with it, the short game, that's people get nervous and also it gets really affected in that short game. So being able to start pressurizing that short game early on will help their outcomes. Yes, Cheryl. My question is, when I'm giving a pitching lesson, do I bring it outside? Do I keep it outside and look at it with them because it's hard to see on the screen? Or do I kick it back in after the shot? For the, to look at the data? Yeah, yeah again, um, depending upon your situation, I know it's kind of harder to see outside. Um, I, I typically would take it inside, sit down, go over what you want to go over, but you could certainly do biofeedback outside. So one of the other things that I would do with players, especially my juniors, because we had uh, 5K players at our academy and 2K coaches, so all my kids knew how to get in, launch the biofeedback and launch their programs because they would do a lot of unsupervised and lightly supervised training. I would create a spreadsheet for them that had carry distance, and then set up position parameters, and then top of swing parameters, so that they can go in and know, okay, when I hit my 50% pitch shot, or my 50% wedge shot, or whatever it is, they know exactly how much rotation they need to put into their program, their activity, and then they can expect to see that appropriate distance. So I really dialed it in based on the shot that they were trying to hit, and then correlating the shot distance 
and even trajectory sometimes, but mostly the distance control back to their, uh, their body rotations. And then we would allow them to go in and say they'd have a program that said 20 yard pitch, 50 yard wedge shot, 70 yard wedge shot, and it would be very detailed, right? The, the difference in the upper body rotation might only be, you know, 7 to 10 degrees, but they were getting in and really dialing in the rotation numbers. And then they know, again, going back to the combine, they, I wanted to isolate one variable. So they knew it wasn't my over rotation because I got the tone. I must have changed my acceleration rates or how I, my body was moving that way. Yes? Did you see any patterns between the result in the combines and the result on the cables? Yeah, so their distance control dispersion improved by, uh, the players that did it the most, it improved by over 25%. They would really bring it in very tight. The more they did it, the better it got. So I just tried it every day. We'd, we'd use biofeedback time every day, right? So we'd have one-on-one -on -one coaching time, then we'd have unsupervised or lightly supervised practice time. And then they were encouraged, the performance center was open before school, they were encouraged to get there early and do some gym time or some biofeedback time as well. Yeah, it was a pretty intense program. And any good uh, drills on, I like the explanation on how you try to get the moves more. Yeah, in, in terms of drills, I wouldn't say any specific drill. I just focused a lot on correlations, right? So, you know, X, apples to apples, you know, so that they understood very clearly when my distance control is off, it's because of this, right? Because I didn't want them, you know, these were some of the best players in Thailand, so I didn't want them going into international tournaments guessing why their distance is off, right? So I always try to isolate the variable down to the nth degree. And, and I know you work with a lot of juniors and adults too, so, you know, those correlations are important because it's very easy to get into a competition and start guessing. Yeah. But could, could you buy, could you guess by a player he or she is good in this distance because of? Yes. Yeah, we would see correlations for sure. So, you know, the players that, again, it's that epic struggle of they're good at short game, they struggle with their driver, vice versa. So, you know, we certainly had a lot of kids that would just rip the cover off the ball but I couldn't get them to hit a wedge shot inside 30 feet right in the beginning. So we worked really hard on isolating what they did well, keep that going, but then forming a kind of a separate program almost to where that they could just work on these things. Yep. And for a player like that, for the Bombers, I found myself giving them body positions that were less so that they had to aggressively rotate harder and faster because they're more accustomed to doing that because they hit the ball so far. I never wanted to get them into a position that was more rotation and gliding into the ball because they would just, they would, they would lay the sod over it all the time, right? So I'd get them into a position where I felt was short, maybe even shorter than it needed to be, so it forced them to have to go after it a little bit more. That, that helped a lot for the longer hitters, trying to get them to dial in their short game. And I think that's a great point Joe made is he played to the student's strengths. So if you have a glider, you might let them rotate a little more and be a little more flowy versus you have that really explosive athlete. Well, do we want to take away that explosive athlete? No, we want it, but we can manage it. And I think that's a, a big thing is play to your strengths. Not everybody has to be taught the same way. It's, it's you know, it's always, we always said how, it's how much, not how. Right, so take, take the weakness and make it a strength. And the other thing that I would do, a lot with those kids is <clears throat> the amount of body rotation, but even more importantly than that, the amount of wrist hinge, yeah. right? Because if they start to hinge more, then they've got a lot more energy in this, in this segment here, right? So I would really limit, you know, Steve Stricker-esque, really limit the amount of wrist hinge, and then let them make the entire motion up with the body rotation, or feel that way. You know, we live in a world today where distance is the name of the game, right? So we're constantly trying to give players more speed. So I feel it's counterintuitive to then go to the short game and tell them something completely opposite. So I try and maneuver the short game to where we can speak the same language as the long game, but just 
cater it to the short shots. Can you expand on how you're using the, the wrist angles in the short game and how you're actually training that with the system? Yeah, so I'll speak to that. Can you pull up the wrist uh, biofeedback? So I, again, different philosophies, right? Just right off the bat, I'll say that. My philosophy is, I so flexion extension is definitely gonna control the face open or closed, okay? More or less deviation, in my opinion, is just a, a power accumulator, right? It's gonna give you the potential to release more speed. So I limit that based on the distance of the shot, right? That's how I would look at that. And then how to train that is if you go, ours has a K icon, yours should have a hand icon in our, an orange circle up there at the top right. You'll be able to load up flexion extension only, deviation only, or both. Okay, so if you're working on distance wedges, load up the deviation, right? Get them to a position at the top where you're comfortable, right, that they can accelerate from there. And there's gonna be some trial and error with that, right? So you'll just have your launch monitor there, see the distance and say, okay, we can tweak it from there to kind of dial in the distance that you're looking for. And then from there, you can have wrist, so you have deviation. And then on the very next line, next activity, you could have body rotation. So, and then link them together if you've linked activities before. So as soon as they, uh, they hit the wrist, it'll go to the body. And, and if their body's in the right position, it'll be like one activity. So now you know they've got the right amount of rotation, the right amount of wrist deviation, and then they can just go after it, right? And then hit that, that shot. So that's how you'd control that or how you could train it. So we're gonna take you through it and just set, like have Joe I'm his student, I have Joe take you through what, what he would do um, using set guide live and putting me in the positions he wants. Right, so again, wrist deviation at the top. I'm just gonna calibrate. Calibration in three, two, one. Calibration complete. Okay, I will say for wrists, set guide live is your best friend. Okay, the, the wrists are so independent to the player and what their body is doing. Set guy live all day long, okay? Just cater it right to that player. So we'll get the player to set up just like you would with the body. And again, if we're working on a distance wedge shot, go up to the top of your swing, right? Okay, so for me, that would be entirely too much. Okay, so we're gonna get a little less hinge, right? Yep. We got our body where we want it. And then from there, you'd simply go over and hit that set guy live button. So now we're gonna dial in that. And again, you could start at 100%. You can get as detailed with the wrists as you want, right, for the better players. Now, if we wanted to do the body as well, real quick before uh, we run out of time here, I will go over to the body and I'll go to rotation at the top, load that up below it. I'll take both of them down to 0, 0.0 for the seconds per rep. I'll launch, train all activities, and link them. So now, okay, so because we're not in the right position with the body, I'll take the hips off, set guy live. Okay, let's go back to address. Didn't get the wrist. Try again. Too much hinge. Okay, so let's just reset guide live for him so that we can show you. Okay, stay there. Okay, go back to address. Okay, we should be good. Okay, so there you saw it went all the way through, right? So he hit both positions, so then he can hit the shot, right? So we're keying in on both. So you can just change the reps, and it could be like, all right, as soon as you hear the ding, go. So it could be, you want to hit restart? Yep. See if I can do it twice in a row. Here, let's do the wrist. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I could coach him. Yeah, Easy. <laughs> Any questions on the short game stuff, or training it, or 
how to really dial it in. I, I hope you all could see that there's definitely ways we could do this. The more specific, the better when it comes to the short game and really paint those correlations between body wrist, carry distance, and trajectory. Good? I'll tell you right now, I was thinking hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, no matter yes. if you do this, I say, on, get on yourself. Timer, uh, you just set the time to zero or? Yeah, 0.0. 0. That way they don't have to stay in that position at all. As soon as it gets there, it'll go to the next one. So it's almost instantaneous for wrist and body, right? So that's how you can do both the wrist and the body at the same time. Right. And I was thinking, so I was waiting for the ding, but you could just have them start making swings and hopefully they only do one, maybe hit that finish rep at the same thing like I did. But Look, you're doing it without even trying. But it's one of those things where you're just going and I just might make normal swings. Maybe I put down 10 balls and I should be able to go through 10 reps and 10 balls. If I have reps left after 10 balls, I miss the positions. It tells me how successful I was by percentage. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time.